Yeah. A nice cup of tea from our Sam. Whilst uh, the custom of drinking tea dates back to the third millennia BC in China and was popularized in England during the 1660s by King Charles II and his wife, the Portuguese Infanta Catherine de Braganza, it was not until the mid 19th century that the concept of afternoon tea first appeared in England. Now, my great grandfather grew tea, but I didn't know a lot about tea itself. I had to learn, so I was steeped in tea for three months, but I've never drunk a drop. He was a Renaissance man who seemed to be able to do everything. He was an inventor, a musician, he could draw maps, he was a sportsman and a photographer, and he was a tea planter. This is his family. His uncle up here owned a flax mill in Drummoness in County Down, Northern Ireland. His father here owned a flour mill. And his mother's family, this is his mother, were landowners. He was the youngest son. Here's the family here and he's the youngest son. Samuel Cleland Davidson. And it's often happened with the youngest son, they didn't inherit anything and had to make their own way in the world. He had a family of his own. And this is my grandmother here, Kathleen Davidson. He was born at Ballymacken Farm, Strand Town, Belfast in 1846. The family lived at Turf Lodge in Belfast, near where Samuel's business was later located. He attended the Belfast Royal Academy, academic institution, but he left at 15 and had two years tutoring in organic chemistry and photography. He started work at his father's flour mill and learned bookkeeping. He liked visiting his uncle in Drummoness, where the flax mill was probably the first in Ulster to have power machinery. Here he may also have seen his uncle John experimenting to improve crop yield. He served an apprenticeship with the town surveyor, William Hastings. In 1864, he received an invitation from his cousin, James Davidson, who was the son of John who owned the flax mill to join him as a tea planter in India. He was to go with four Ulstermen to help run a group of tea estates in which the Davidson family had an interest. So with him went Harry Hunter, Dick Doak and Dawson Baxter. And while he was in India, he kept a diary. This is a sample of his diary. And uh, he kept it all the, way, all the time that he was there. He set off on his long journey from Greenock in Scotland. And he says, we weighed anchor at 6 a.m. and commenced our voyage on board the Kashmir, a ship powered by steam and sail. The date was the 31st of August, 1864. By the 8th of September, they had passed Tenerife. A steam pipe had burst by the mail room and their boxes were moved to their cabin. The violin was all right and he played it for a while. 20, 20th September, commenced learning Hindustani from a book I got from the Stuarts, they were friends and got on very well, 22nd of September. Got up by the captain at 4 a.m. to say, see St. Helena. 1st of October, at six o'clock I saw Table Mountain, but the captain wasn't sure about it. 2nd of October, went ashore. Harry and I got a horse 
and started from for Constancia. Um, price for the day, five shillings. I never saw a more beautiful road in my life. We saw serpents and lizards and all sorts of beautiful birds. By the 28th of October, they were in Ceylon, Sri Lanka as it is now. 5th of November, 1864, we were at Garden Reach, having made our journey from Greenock in exactly 66 days. Not bad for round the Cape Passage. The youths then traveled from Calcutta to Kachar by river, leaving on the 16th of November, a distance of 600 miles. So they're going up from Kachar, up the Brahmaputra River. For a great part of the way, the Brahmaputra was swampy flat land, and it was not long before they had fever and dysentery. 2nd of December. We're off much sooner than we have been these few days, starting before daylight, a long time. Employed the greater part of the day writing my home journal. All the fellows wanted to know if it were a will I was writing. We passed within about two miles of the mountains and last night the temperature was down almost 50 degrees. About 11 o'clock, we put our feet on the station ground at Kachar and were immediately hailed by two Europeans who turned out to be the two Sambaris, senior and junior. And that's something like the sight they would have seen coming into Kachar. Life in Kachar. Life in a bungalow is much the same in all of them. Servants are either Muslim or Hindu. The former are recruited in Calcutta and brought to the bungalow. The latter are local and chosen from the better coolies in the garden to do bungalow work. It is difficult to persuade the Muslim to leave the delights of Calcutta to go to the wilds of Assam. And he had been taught from his youth that the area is full of devils and the only way to acquire their services is to double or treble their wages. Without this inducement, they will refuse to enter the service. The ordinary day in Kachar is up at five, Chota Hazri, which is a pre-breakfast, at 5.30, work until 11, then Hazri is served. On the 6th of December, he said, Hazri here is quite substantial, tea, eggs, toast, and then Bura Laziz is at 12 and just like dinner. And after that, rest until two, followed by work until 5.30 or six, bath and dinner, and finally adjourn to the veranda, where reading, smoking, a chat if there's anyone to talk to with over the day's work until 9.30, Bedtime brings the day to, the, to a close. Samuel went to the Silhet district up here, northeast of Dhaka, to a garden owned by the Assam Tea Company, who took over the growing of tea from the government. The government had started growing tea as an experiment, having found it was positive, and also that tea grew naturally in India, they sold off their experimental gardens and made money out of it. His father had interests in them and Samuel was placed in a garden in Putteria, which is up here. So after five months at 18 years old, Sam, sorry, it had been settled that Dawson is to go home. This is the five months later on the 23rd of May, 1865. It had been settled that Dawson is to go home at once. And as someone must go along with him, as far as Calcutta, James has got the job and I am go, go down to Putara to take his place until he returns. Putara is a, 
is a garden. So he and I rode out to Bukola in order that I may send down some things to Putana. On the way back, we had a splendid game of hockey on the station ground. So after five months at 18 years old, Samuel is responsible for the Putana tea garden. Hockey though is not really hockey. Uh, when he talks about hockey, he is really talking about polo. Polo was first played by Europeans in a club formed in Kachar. The Europeans first came across the game being played by local tribesmen. In 1859, they formed the first polo club, the Silchar Polo Club, with seven members, one of whom was James Davidson. 28th of October, 1865, played hockeys with the Munapuris this evening to all the ponies. 29th of October, 1865, Sunday, bought a tat, which was a polo pony, from the Munapuris this morning for 125 rupees. The other day, Bila died, so I hope the beast may turn out well. Harry Hunter went over to Tara this morning and Harry Gregg and I went over the old garden, had hockey in the evening, Harry G's first attempt. All dined here after dinner. James and Harry G went over to Boothley's and slept there and they were away at daybreak tomorrow to explore a road. Racing. Races today at 3 p.m. They were pretty good. I rode in Confederacy, James and Stitchfield, and won the uh, winner's handicap on Pentland. Was at Mrs. Coburn's music party, played some duet with Mrs. C. She plays beautifully. Tuesday the 10th of March 1868. Got a loan of Burry's colours for the race. It was now at about eight. Oldfield on Bali won it easily. Raja second, Thunderbolt third and Stockwell fourth. There were eight went round it. We had two more scratch races, hockey match in the evening, Munipuras versus Europeans. Munipuras won. So what was there to do there? Well, there was entertainment. 15th of February 1866. This morning at Tara, a lot of strolling play players came and performed. The chap who did the tricks did some wonderful ones. There were little girls who, I think, have next to no bones in their bodies. After the usual routine of the garden in September 1866, we all started after breakfast along with Boothley for Harry's as yesterday was his 22nd birthday and he is giving a big dinner tonight. On the way over, Boothley, Morris and I got awfully stung by hornets. My husband did and they're very painful. 2nd of January 1866, went to Mrs Stewart's for a music party. I played some solos and on the whole, music was prime, supper afterwards. So what was the food like? George Baker, who wrote a book about the tea growing area of India says this, how to vary the diet. The monotony of chicken meat remains unchanged. Chicken in every form, chicken cutlets, steaks, mince, spascocks, rissoled, roasted, boiled, curried, in soup, on toast, fried, deviled, and many other ways. No man exists who has been to India and has not been compelled to sit down in, uh, to at least one meal a day in which chicken figures conspicuously in one form or another. The only provisions that can be depended upon are tin goods. For they make large, but they make large demands on a limited purse. The cost in Assam after freight from England made them almost prohibitive to the poor person on only 150 rupees a month.
found James Stewart at Jemmy Lowe's and as he was going to Putteria, we all went together, breakfasted at Tara. James and James Stewart went to Chota Domi. They came back to Putteria and stayed there all night. I went back to Tara Darni and stayed there. 27th of April, 1865. Went over all the garden. Although this was bizarre day, yet there were some cookies working. While there, one of them found a bee's nest. I made them open it up and I got about three quarters of a seer, which is one and a half pounds of honey from it. I opened another in a tree, but only got a few ounces. So how to vary the diet of chicken and honey. Hunting and shooting was not just for fun. It brought a welcome change to the diet. Garden work all morning. Went out in evening and had some shooting on hatties. Hatties were elephants in the jungle below Stool's garden. Got one pig. 4th of May, 1866. Harry and McKelvey went over to Tara today and Harry had good snipe shooting there now. The Maestra came to me this morning to go to shoot a tiger above his house but when I went with my big rifle it turned out to be a Muldry Paku. This might be a civet. James and 61 head of coolies arrived this evening. Harry says he was out after a tiger the other day but wasn't in a position to shoot him although he saw him but when he is going out again, he is to send for me and James. So Samuel did kill a tiger because it was in, on the floor in our house until my mother decided it was too moth eaten and it had to go. He also tells us on the 18th of, uh, the 30th of March, 1867. I got quite a good hand at standing on the elephant yesterday as we were over such rough ground and today I was quite able to shoot standing. So they were standing up on the elephant to shoot. Photography. If you look into his financial records you see a lot of photography equipment being bought because of his interest in photography. On the 14th of February 1866, he said, My photographic tank arrived this morning from the station. I expect everybody else was using their money to buy tinned meat, but he chose to buy photography equipment. He said, I tried the dry plates, but on account of the bad box, they were in light, so nothing came of it. Good one of Harry Gregg. Printed a lot of photographs today, most of which I gave to Drake, who came out with me last night and we went away in the evening today. Second of May, 1867 commenced a series of photos of the Burkola bungalow. It is panoramic as each view joins to the other. The series will consist of views all round the house. 18th of March. Doak was keen to have his photograph taken, so I did one of him. A planter's bungalow. The main portion of the bungalow is built with large uprights sunk deep down into the ground, generally trunks of good sized trees with the bark peeled off about five to 12 foot deep. A deep notch is made in the upper uprights in which the, to place the floor. 
the height of the floor varies depending on the height of the uprights obtained. The higher, the better. The idea of this is to prevent close proximity to the ground, to keep away malaria, and the floor of the bungalow as clear as possible from the pestiferous earth. This is the inside of a planter's bungalow. Last night, we caught no less than four rats before going to bed. You see the rats? As I have some wee eruptions on my feet, I thought it would do me some good to take some medicine and clear the system a bit. So I took it this morning and I necessarily had to plan in the house all day and was pretty sick all through the day. The process of growing tea was what he had to learn. The process of fermenting and tea rolling excised his fertile mind. He started his work in India by mapping out the area for the first time, bringing to use his training with the Belfast Surveyor Company. However, he became interested with the methods of producing and cultivating of the tea crop. He soon became an authority on the subject, whose opinion was widely sought. He experimented with different techniques for fermenting, rolling and drying the leaf to produce better tea. This photograph was taken in 1868, and these are some of the planters he associated with on a regular basis. And he lists the plantations which they married, managed so there's Harry Gregg and Oldfield, Barry, that's my great grandfather. There's Doch and uh, other ones that he associated with. Making tea. He went out there to learn how to make tea. There used to be 11 processes in making tea, but by the time Samuel got there, it was down to seven. Tea was brought to India in 1833 from China as an experiment. In fact, the Chinese protected their tea and I think it was stolen. It was found that there were indigenous tea plants in India already. In 1840, the Assam Company got rights from the government to tea gardens and large tracts of land thought to be suitable for growing tea. Most of these photographs are Samuel's own. The first part of the process is to pluck the tea. All the women, but about 10, were taken off the old garden this morning to pluck leaf. This is their very first day at work. So of course, I had an awful amount of bother showing them the way and keeping them in the gullies. There were also 36 Bengalis plucking in all 68. So you can see how many people were needed in the tea plantations. February the 14th, plucking. St. Valentine's Day, but no Valentines are going here. There were no women. Plucked a little tea today for the first time this season. Heavy showers all day, which is the first rain we have had of any consequence since mid-November. Once the tea was plucked, it had to be weighed. March 1868. This was the day Tid said the elephants would come, but they didn't. We are getting on well, both building and tea making. Getting about 12 mons of dry leaf a day. A mond was about 80 pounds. eighteen sixty seven April got all the central posts of number three tea house up this morning. Our pluck of leaf today was twelve and a half mons. Yesterday it was fifteen and Tuesday twenty two and a half mons green leaf. I think we will make about ninety mons this month. That's about seven hundred and twenty pounds of tea. The women have their leaf weighed and got a chit with the weight and pe were paid according to the weight they picked. 
you can see the man here weighing the tea in the basket. Once the tea was weighed, it had to be withered. The tea was laid out on wire mesh to wither and it was damp and the wire disintegrated pretty quickly. 26th of June, 1867. Rain still every day and all day. Fine for transplanting, but very bad for withering leaf. Shunnel was not in the garden when Harry went over last night, so he didn't get the wire netting. He has been off his garden for five days. He tried to improve things, so this was an early withering loft that he built. Withering relief this morning, partly in the cylinder. So he started to make machinery for withering the leaf. Here is the cylinder. And it seemed to do very well, but the handle broke. There's the little handle at the end. It broke in the middle of the day, so it was no use to mend it again. Very hot day today again. We had so little rain yet that the rivers are cold water height almost. Friday the 5th of June 1868. Tea house work all day experimenting on withering of leaf. I am beginning to see, unless I have it plucked and withered all in one day, that it will be most difficult to manage. So this is a later withering machine that he built with a drum, a big drum that the leaves went in. Samuel started his process with a method of rolling the leaf with extensive experiments and drawings for the process of making tea. These are some of his drawings. <coughs> rolling, 7th of May, 1867 was busy all day with Harry in the tea house, getting the new system of rolling into working order. This, the leaf commenced at one end of the table. One man gives it 30 rolls. It is then sifted in a congu sieve, which brings out the flowery piku. It then goes through six men's hands. And when the six men roll it a little, it is finished. So even that was quite labor intensive. So he invented a machine for rolling tea. The machine consists of a pendulum attached to the bottom of which is a frame, the shape of an arc, and which oscillates over a parallel arc with an arrangement for raising or depressing the pendulum through the distance of a few inches. To work the machine, the leaf, after being withered, is put into bags and the bags put between the two arcs. The pendulum is made to oscillate. As the leaf in the bag decreases in bulk and as it becomes rolled, the pendulum is depressed so as to keep the pressure on the leaf still uniform. The advantage to be gained by using the machine are first, a great saving of labor and expense in rolling the leaf when compared with doing so by hand labor. Second, from its construction, it requires very little power to drive and is not liable to get out of order easily. I think really it was based a bit on a grandfather clock with its pendulum. A roller here in 1943 really hasn't changed much from his original design. The next process is fermenting. The leaf has to be left to ferment. It is right when half the withered leaf is red and half is green. The leaf has to be fired. The tea was fired using charcoal. The room where the tea was fired was about 140 degrees. The coolies had to be swapped around out of the firehouse. It was so hot. 7th of August, 1866, Tuesday. By experiments last night, I find that if the leaf is allowed to dry of its own accord after roasting and not fired over charcoal at what once the leaf will redden so it keeps it damp 
I now cover it with blankets after roasting. The great object in making tea that will infuse quickly is to bring out all the sap from the heart of the leaf, or rather the veins, and deposit it on the outside of the leaf. So he wanted to find a way to dry the tea effectively. This was an early dryer. And uh, it worked, it dried the tea, but then he got big and efficient. This is the first drying machine that had an updraft, so the fan pushed the hot air up and dried the tea. He was always trying to improve the fans because they were the key to drying tea successfully. He searched for a good fan. His search for a good fan led him to try a multi-bladed fan in 1886. He had a wind tunnel to experiment with his fans with heavy oak doors at one end. He wanted to see if the fans would blow the door open. This new fan blew open the heavy oak doors to 90 degrees. What a wonderful moment that must have been. The Sirocco forward bladed centrifugal fan had been born. With the new fan, Davidson was able to make his first Sirocco downdraft tea dryer. His friend said the fan was like the hot Sirocco wind. So Davidson and company became Sirocco Engineering Works. Unfortunately, sifting tea was the next problem. Tea was made very labor intensive. And you can see here the children working on the tea plantation alongside the women at various activities. Here they are picking out the pico, the buds and the best part of the tea. April, 1867. Was in the tea house all morning with Harry, experimenting on making golden pico, but was not very successful. We had boys picking out pico from the green leaf. 27th of April, 1867. Harry left to go on tour by Kugel, Mount Sapur and McMeekins. After he left, I hit on a good plan. After giving the leaf 40 rolls, the pico buds break off. A Congo sieve takes it all out where it can be manufactured separately. This was how you made money. Pico was the best quality tea. If you could separate out the Pico, you got ever so much more money for tea made from Pico. The tea had to be sorted. Tea was graded according to quality. Flowering Pico was the very best quality. Orange Pico next and Pico. Souchon, Congu, and Bohia. Rained heavily this morning, cleared about nine, and we all went to the tea house and weighed a hundred pounds sorted tea. It sorted into Pico, 33%, Souchon, 38%, Congu, 20%, and Bohia, 9%. Of course, he had to invent a machine then for sorting tea. While most planters were content to make tea by the accepted techniques, Samuel Davidson carried out endless experiments. He kept a diary of his experiments and over time, certain principles emerged. Factors that had not been thought of by anyone else suddenly took on significance and became essential for good teas to be produced. He cultivated the tea, finding that the local tea made a good root, and then he would uh, graft on the Chinese tea onto the local tea root. He kept uh, 
account of everything. So in 1866 and 67, this was the total pounds of his tea crop. And that's before he went to this plantation in Barcola, which he actually bought. After he'd been there for two years, it went up from uh, the 39,785 to 50,549, just in two years. And it, it went up a bit, even after six years, he was still getting an increased crop. Looking after the garden was much more about people um, as much as it was about tea. Twenty seventh of February, eighteen sixty six. This morning, I was round, roused by Lal Roy about five o'clock, as thirteen Calcutta coolies had run away. I sent him off at once to Pen Shopping Road to tell the villagers they might catch them and for each man get five rupees. One man was brought back in the morning. I, Harry Hunter and Lal Roy were out along the pen ch chopping road all night, keeping the villagers alert. Next day, Wednesday, we were unsuccessful in catching any out in the busties, but while we were away, two were caught near the, the number four teller. A teller was a hill. Two more were caught this forenoon and this evening two more came back of their own accord as they were starving in the jungle. Some still adrift, we are pretty sure of catching three of them. Twenty, uh, 3rd of May 1865, Wednesday. Cholera has broken out in the garden pretty strong and two of the coolies have died already from the effects, was over the garden this morning, was round with the coolies. Dawson is feeling the damp in a good deal and coughing at night. Cholera just as bad as when I was away with Dawson. I think it was a good job to get him away from here on account of the cholera, cholera raging so strongly. Several of the older men who were the best on the garden have been carried off by it. It must have been the last coolies who were brought up here that brought the disease along. Started for Bacola very early this morning. This is uh, 8th of May. Met Tom Burry at the Fatinga Mook coming in to have his tooth out. It happens a man called Second Byrub murdered a woman called Kimmy last night and then went off and hanged himself. When I got to the garden, I at once wrote off to Daly informing him of it and asking a Darunga to be sent out with proper powers what to do. Tom got his tooth pulled and came back to the garden in the evening. The Daruga arrived this morning inquiring into the case minutely and had the bodies sent into the station. He, however, could discover no cause for the murder whatever, and the cause of the suicide, he said, was of course because the man knew he would be hanged anyway for murder. These are the tellers. You can see the tea plants built right up the hillsides. The maintenance of the gar garden was labour intensive. The jungle wanted to take over and the soil got washed down the hillsides called tellers. The plants too were subject to disease. 24th of August. Watered a number of blighted bushes round the roots with dilute sulfuric acid, three ounces acid to a water can full of water, one cap full to 10 plants. It was the blighted bushes of Sam Teller alone that were watered. To keep the jungle away, the gardens had to be hoed. I was out at work, 1867, most of the day, only hoeing and building going on today.
transplanting. Heavy rain last night, transplanted all day, got 4,500 plants. The greater part of the Ivum teller is finished, although we have got about 20,000 plants with this rain. No manufacturing going on at present. The bushes had to be pruned. These thousands of bushes had to be pruned and cared for. 4th of December, 1865. Getting a good deal of leaf off it now after being so well plucked last time. Planted some seeds. A number of bushes were left, you see, to grow tall. And these would produce seed. Seed was a good money spinner. The tea had to be tasted. Tea was made and put into two and a half grams of water on the leaves and left for six minutes. Then the tea and liquid are separated and the tea put in white porcelain cups for the tea tasters analysis. In addition, the dry leaves are also presented separately for the tea taster to study. Well, what do you put the tea in when you've dried it and processed it? You have to make tea chests. Here are the elephants clearing the jungle for tea chests. By far the best tea chests are the teak ones from Rangoon. The wood is impervious to insects of all kinds, even white ants. In many districts, these boxes are unavailable and local ones have to be made. So they're in the process of getting the wood to make tea chests. When you have the tea chests, the tea has to be packed. 7th of June, 1867. Finished packing the pico and started packing the congu in the evening. Saturday, 16th of May, 1868. Put out the pico in the sun today, preparing to pack. Pack the souchong. It was only seven chests. Harry was laid up a bit of fever today, but was pretty nearly all right again in the evening. 21st of May, 1868. Finished the packing of the pico yesterday. There were 17 chests, making a total of this charlo of 31 shillings. Of course, Packing was labour intensive, and you can see them here tipping the tea into the chests here from the big containers, the big baskets. So he made machines for packing tea. Samuel sold his tea business to Sir Thomas Lipton because he decided that he wanted to concentrate on machinery for producing tea and not on growing tea. And Lipton's tea is still around. It was a tough life living in Kachar. In, on Tuesday, the 22nd of June, 1869, he said, I went over to Balachara this morning and saw what was a doing. Tom came in from the station again, just as I was at breakfast and reported Harry better. Heard from James and Jenny this evening that poor Harry Hunter is dead. I feel very sad about this, for he was such a fine, good-hearted fellow and was so long my companion. I feel as if I have almost lost a brother. He is the second gone of the four of us who came out together, and only Doke and I are left. And strange to say, we are the ones who remained in India. 3rd of March, 1869. Dreamt I was at home last night, and I saw father, and that he was better and able to come downstairs, but still, there was some grief in the house and mother was crying. I got a letter this evening from Maria and uh, all say father is declining fast, but he's not suffering so much as he was. 
heard this morning, 13th of March, 1869, heard this morning of my poor father's death from Jenny and John. He died on 2nd of February, just close on two months after Uncle John died. He suffered very much pain from a cancer on the liver. And it was this, I believe, carried him off at last. He has been ill so long and suffering so much that he must have been glad actually to get away. And it makes me resign to his death, knowing that his pains and troubles are over and he has gone to where the weary are at rest. His life was an example to us all. In 1873, Samuel went briefly back to Ireland and managed to get married. Clara came out with him to India and on the 8th of November, 1873, Annie was born. However, her ayah caught measles when she was eight months old and Annie died on the 24th of July, 1874. Beside her grave in Kachar, the tragedy of children, of friends and colleagues, Clara returned to Ireland and stayed there while Samuel was in India. This is a little painting that was done of Annie. His sister Annie also died age 40. And this is her. And this is his wife, Clara. Saturday, 15th of May. Got the joyful news by telegraph this morning of the birth of our little daughter on the 13th of May. The telegram was, daughter, one o'clock afternoon, both splendid. This is grand news and I am so glad everything has gone so well. I telegraphed to Clara in reply and also had just time to get out with a chit that is likely to be in time for the mail. It was just 45 hours from, the from when the baby was born till I heard of it by telegram. By the time I got the chit to Clara written and the telegram sent off, it was breakfast time. And then we drank the health of mother and daughter in champagne. He had a further three children, Jim, Dick, and Kathleen, my grandmother. Dick, on the left here, died of meningitis at 19 years old. Jim worked his way up the company, now employing a thousand people making tea machinery, and was prepared to take over from his father. And this is Dick. World War I intervened and Jim and the Ulster Volunteer Force went to France. He was killed at the Somme on the 1st of July, 1916. Samuel returned to Belfast in 1879 to start his own firm to construct dryers. In 1913, his daughter Kathleen was in India and traveled to Sabon. We got to Sabong at 12 o'clock, she says. The bungalow is so pretty, silhouetted uh, overlooking a lake and the flowers everywhere were lovely. Glorious pinks and red lilies, bougainvillea, passion flower and lots of others I'd never saw before. What a lovely spot it is, but it must have seemed like going to the end of the world when father and you went out. Even now, it seems to me terribly far from civilization. And that's one of his drawings of the bungalow. As a businessman, he was very successful. His centrifugal fan, this is one of the bigger ones, brought clean air to coal mines and ventilation to remove dust and fumes, not to mention fresh air to dreadnoughts. In 1921, the man with 168 patents to his name was awarded the Order of the British Empire by King George V 
He died two months later on the 18th of August, 1921. The Northern Bank in Northern Ireland had a series called Inventors and he was on the 50 pound note. Here he is with his tea machines. And those are the flowers of the tea there. And recently, just in February this year, we had a ceremony to put a blue plaque up in Belfast in his honour, which I was able to attend before the lockdown. He was a Protestant, but he employed both Protestants and Catholic workers, whom he defended with his pistol if necessary. And when he died, the whole of the Short Strand, a Catholic street in Belfast, followed the coffin out of respect for his employing Catholic workers. He was 75 years old when he died. The end. <laughs>